Amen. All right, I love Matthew 7. There's, there's so many things in Matthew 7 that you could preach on. Um, I mean, there's, there's a dozen sermons alone just in this one chapter. It's very famous for many of the verses in it. But I want to look at verse number 14. Matthew 7, 14. It says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus is teaching us here about salvation, that there's very few people that will actually be saved, that will actually find the path to salvation. Look, He says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Now the word straight here doesn't mean like a straight line. It means narrow, just as it's defined by the next word. But, you know, maybe there's something we can learn by looking at another a Bible version. Like, the New King James Version says, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way. Salvation is difficult, according to the New King James. What if I said that the New King James is just as good? What would you say? Wrong. How about, just as good as what? Right? Just as good as horse pucky, right? Look, it's just as good as the New Living Translation. I want you to look at your Bible. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. Is what the New King James teaches. The New, New Living Translation says, but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. Let me tell you something. Salvation is not difficult. According to the Bible, salvation is easy. Yeah. Salvation is simple. You have faith as a child. It's compared to walking through a door, drinking a glass of water, eating bread. Jesus did all the hard work. All you have to do is put your faith in Him. But these false Bibles want to get you to think that it's difficult. That it's a process over time. You have to be willing to turn from your sin. You have to try to become a perfect person. And that is a lie. There's a reason that this church is King James only. And it used to just be called the Holy Bible. Then the authorized Bible. And now we refer to it as the King James Bible. Not that King James wrote it or that it was based, it was all on his shoulders. That's just how it's referred to. And let me tell you, God's word is trustworthy. Right. It's very important that we understand the difference between the Bible that we carry and the Bible that the rest of the world has. Yeah. So when I say that the new King James Bible is just as good, that's a true statement. But let me tell you, it is not as good as the King James. Right, right. The world wants you to consider the New King James Bible is a bridge to the heresy of the NIV. Yeah, In fact, there were, there were translators that helped with the New King James Bible that actually did the NIV as well. There's a lot of heresy and confusion. This Bible takes things that are simple and it makes them confusing. And what I want to do today is help you see through the difference between the New King James and the King James. I want to help you Learn to be able to spot a fake. Amen. And just as people that work in the banking industry, if you handle money all day long, and then you pick up a counterfeit, you know it. You know it right away. Whatever your industry is, when you handle the real thing, and you touch something that's, that's fake, you know it. You recognize it. And if I have a, a New King James Bible here, I think Brother Joe left it here. He likes to read it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. One of our, who brought this Bible? I think no, maybe me. I'm not sure. I think it was you. Yeah, one, you, one of our soul winners brought this back. They got somebody saved. They said, "You have a Bible. Let me see it." And they looked at it and they said, "Whoa, this won't do. This is not the same." You understand what we just read? It says salvation is difficult. That is not what God's word teaches. And I want to help you to be able to spot a fraud, not just with the New King James, but with any Bible. Now, the verse that I want you to remember is Matthew 7:14. Remember those numbers. That's what we just read. Hey, 7 times 2 is 14. Maybe that'll help you connect some dots. But anybody that has a New King James or a New Living Translation, that's a great place to take them and show them that salvation is different. And I'm going to prove to you today that in this Bible, salvation isn't just difficult as they say here. It is totally changed throughout the entire Bible. Yeah. Old and New Testament. We're going to look at some key verses. But a lot of what we're going to look at actually applies to all the other Bibles. There is a lie about the New King James Bible. They say it's, it's just like the, the King James. People will say it's the fifth edition of the King James. There's a lot of lies that are being propped up, how it's just as good, it's very similar. And again, I'm going to show you how you can spot it for yourself. One of the things that really bothers me about the New King James is they conveniently change words to change doctrine. They change words not when the Greek or the Hebrew would call for it, 
They change words to help support other religions. This Bible will support the Jehovah's Witnesses. It will support the Catholics. There are certain things that it, they have changed that they could conveniently preach out of and say, see, it's the same, as, but it's not. It's different than the King James. There is a big difference. One of the biggest things that, that bothers me about it is how they change God. They take the name God out a lot of times. They take the name Lord out. The Lord Jesus Christ is under attack in this Bible. They take the word Godhead out. In your King James Bible, that's found in there three times. Guess what? The Godhead is a trinity, right? These three are one. And of course, they want to eliminate references to that. They also remove references to heaven. Now on the flip side, they remove a lot of references to hell. They would, re they would put Hades or Sheol. Do you know what Sheol is? No. <laughs> well, I don't know either. You know what I mean? Like, why would they do that? Why would they intentionally put something in that's confusing? And especially with Hades, something that you could point to in worldly literature and say, well, this is, this is man's devices, this is man's literature, that's what Hades is. And if you ever, if you ever seen the History Channel, which by the way is like a bunch, it's about aliens and it's not history at all, but they like to, put, there are people they've had on their channel that would point to this and say, see, Hades was made up, hell doesn't real, isn't real at all. It's just a tradition from the ninth century. No, God has talked about hell since the beginning. Right. God has warned us from the beginning. And listen, salvation is free. Salvation is easy. God made it very simple. It's a matter of what's in your heart, not how your lifestyle is. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you trust that Jesus is God and that He died for your sins, and you understand the punishment for your sin is death and hell, the second death, the lake of fire, and you realize that Jesus died and went to hell for you so you don't have to go, you've got it. It's a very simple concept. But all the other Bibles want to add the repent of your sins or you have to be willing to turn from sin or salvation is a process. And we're going to look at some of those verses today. But when it also takes, like I said, hell, but the devil. They change the verbiage about the devil. They take the word devils completely out of the Bible. The Bible warns us about devils and of course they want to change it and make it mysterious or confusing. And they change the word evil various different ways to where you're not really sure if you're reading a definition that would be talking about something evil. They use words that don't really make sense in the context. They also take out the word Jehovah everywhere. In every instance that our Bible has the word Jehovah, God's name, they've removed it. They remove the phrase, the New Testament. They remove damnation. Now, these are some big things because the average Joe will pick this up and say, yep, it sounds just like the King James. But let me tell you something. If you study your Bible, if, if there's a passage you know, like Romans or Corinthians, or there's something that you know well, I would encourage you to pick one of these up. Go to the dollar store, get you one of these pieces of junk, right? Read it online and just look at it and right away God's Spirit's going to reveal things to you. Well, that's different. Why would they word that different? Well, that doesn't make as much sense as what the Bible does because this doesn't count as a real Bible. I don't believe in God's eyes. Fake. There, it is fake. And there's a big attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. They change where He's called Master. They change it to just Teacher. They change where He's called the Son of God to He's a servant of God. Now, the Jews knew that when Jesus said that He was the Son of God, they knew that He was saying He was God. They picked up stones to stone Him because He made Himself equal with God when He said He was the Son of God. Well, this Bible says, no, nah, He's just a servant. Hey, I'm a servant of God, but by no means am I the Son of God. I'm not the Messiah that was promised to come. And they make it, they make it very confusing. They have a New Age twist. Instead of saying, the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll say, the Christ. They make it sort of New Age. So, we're going to look at some of that. Now, one of the important things that's different about this and the, the excuses that people will use as to why you should use this is because it eliminates the these and the thous. Oh, that's just so confusing, the these and the thous. But listen, the these and the thous are more accurate. Yeah. That's right. And once you see what, how it works, it makes so much more sense because you can understand who's being spoken to. People that speak other languages than English, they love to make fun of English. They really do. Your language is just bastardized. It's words put together that don't make sense. And how many different ways we use the word you is an example. 
In the Bible, the singular would be thou instead of you. Thou means I'm talking to one person. You means I'm talking to a crowd. Thee is the same. Ye and thee. Thy and thine are all... Anything with the T is singular. And if you just understand that, thee, thou, thine, and thine, that's one person, that's singular, you're talking to one subject. But if it's ye, yours, Ewan's, no, that's not in there, sorry. I know we're close to Georgia. I just had to throw that in. Y'all, y'all, now we're talking. <laughs> that's obviously plural, okay. Another big lie about this Bible is they'll say that it's based on the Texas Receptus. Textus Receptus means the received text, the, the traditional text of what we've always had. And that's not true. It's loosely based on it. There's a lot that is based on it. But the changes that they make, like I said, they will support the Catholic Bibles. It supports all the other funny Bible versions. There are so many things that this has in common with the NIV, the NASB, the NLT, that it just makes it unacceptable as a trustworthy edition of the Bible. And even, even the Hebrew source, the, they don't go to the same Hebrew that the King James uses. They use a different source for the Hebrew. So it's almost like all bets are off. It may sound King James in some parts, and then the devil's going to, with subtlety, is going to inject something that can cause problems down the road. Also, this Bible, this Bible is like a, a fag-friendly Bible. It takes out reprobates. It takes out sodomites. It takes out sons of Belial. The Bible warns us about sons of the devil that work for the devil, that have given over their heart wholly to serve the devil, and this wants to remove it. It may call them perverted persons or perverts. Hey, yeah, they're perverts, but see, here's the problem. When the Bible uses a word like sodomite, we know what that is, okay? Wicked as hell. Now, when they change it and they say, well, it's just a pervert, well, then somebody on the outside could argue, well, hey, we're all perverts in some way or another. Yeah, but we're not all sodomites, okay? There's a reason God uses the words. And hey, every word of God is pure. Amen. Every word in here matters, and it's there for a reason. And this Bible is not inspired. This is not something that God looks down and He's pleased if you're using it. It will cause confusion. In James 5, where it says, Confess your faults one to another. They change this to say, Confessing your trespasses one to another. Trespasses are sins. I do not confess my sins to you. I confess them to God. Yeah. Now, as a brother, I would confess my faults. Sorry, man, I'm late. Sorry, I'm too busy. Sorry, I'm distracted. But my sins are confessed to God and God alone. So they change things that would prop up a Catholic priesthood, confessing your sins to men. Now, one of the biggest problems that I found is the footnotes in this Bible. The footnotes, like anytime they make a major change, they'll have a footnote with a reference where it'll say uh, NU or dash M. If you've ever looked at it online, you'll know what I'm talking about. And what they're referring to essentially is the Westcott and Hort notes, but they don't use Westcott and Hort. They're talking about the Nestle Aland combined with the Universal Bible Society or United Bible Society. So the NU, they say, oh, well, these are two different groups that have Bibles, but what they're really talking about all goes back to one thing, it's the devil's Bible. It is the Westcott and Hort Bible. These men were perverts. These men were, were involved in secret societies and arguably Satan worship. And they were the Jesuits that created a new Bible to counter the King James Bible. And that wasn't successful. There are people that still recognize this is pure. The other Bibles are missing all these verses. So the devil had to have a comeback. He's trying to... He's trying to fight, right? So he had to come up with something that was close to this. Something that the world would say, well, this must be the fifth edition. This is just like a King James, isn't it? But it's not. It's not the King James. Hey, N stands for not the King James. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that. This is right. not the King James. And like I said, there were actually nine translators that worked on the committee that also served on the NIV committee. Now, wait a minute. We know the NIV is wrong. We know the methods that they used to interpret the Bible, to translate the Bible, were erroneous. Yeah. So how is it we can say, well, these guys messed up, but it's okay, we'll get them to work for us. No, they're going to do the same thing. It's going to be the same problem. They're going to find an excuse and a reason to change God's Word. And those nine guys, I don't need to give you their names, but listen, according to the Bible, they have taken their part out of the book of life. Yeah. They are unsavable because they have intentionally changed God's Word. Now listen, without getting too deep or too heady 
into the, the information about the scripts. There are over 4,000 copies of the Bible. And what's, that's what they call the majority text. And then you have what they call the minority text, where there's probably less than 40, but ultimately it's, it comes down to two, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. These two scripts are, they've been erased, they're clearly changed, and it's those two that the minority text is based on. The King James Bible, we can have confidence in it because we can look at the Bibles from 1,000, 2,000, even farther back with the Old Testament, and it's identical. It is exactly the same. But these new Bibles, they would reference the minority, the ones they don't have a lot of copies for. The Texas Receptus with the received text is called the majority. Now the minority that's wrong, it's called the critical text because they recognize that it is criticizing what every other Bible says. And that's the goal of the New King James Bible is to get you to be the critic. Well, did God really say that? Yea, hath God said. They want you to be the judge and that's why they put the footnotes and why they change words so that you can look at it and say, well, this one's better and it's different. And you begin to change doctrine over time. But ultimately, you make yourself a judge of God's Word. This is a very dangerous position to be in and that is the goal. There's the difference between the Antiochian and the Alexandrian. Hey, it was Antioch that they were first called Christians. That is the majority text. And again, I don't want to get too deep on that. I want to show you some scriptures. Let's take a look. We're in Matthew 7. Like I said, they want to make the simple things confusing. They want to make the easy to be understood difficult. Look at verse 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now here we have two opposites. We have straight, which means narrow, and we have broad. Hey, the broad way is you go down to the Bible bookstore and you're going to find a hundred different Bibles in there and then you're going to find the King James. And these hundred others, that's the broad way, right? The narrow path is, well, how come there's only a few King James? Well, not popular like these new ones are. Now, the King James is still the all-time bestseller, but now the NIV is becoming more and more popular because they... They put a new spin on it, the mom Bible, the busy mom Bible, and the teen study Bible, and they've got all these, they have to come up with something new every year. And in the New King James, he said, where it says straight gate, they say, enter by the narrow gate. Now listen, this is this is essentially an accurate translation. They're saying where it says straight isn't talking about a straight line, it's talking about a thin area, right? A narrow way. They got it right in this verse. Look at the next verse in verse 14. Because Straight is the gate. Now in the New King James it says, narrow is the gate. They actually got it right. But in the King James it goes on and defines it again. It gives us straight is the gate and narrow is the way. And this is where their deception comes in. They say difficult is the way. They got it right in the verse before. They got it right in the first reference in this verse. And then they intentionally make salvation difficult instead of narrow. Narrow is not impossible. Narrow is not difficult. Narrow is still easy, but it's not difficult. And that's heresy. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So like I said, Matthew 7, 14 is the best place to start with somebody to show them where a New King James Version is wrong. There's several references where they'll take words that are very confusing. Like, like who knows what linen is? Everybody. <laughs> Who knows what Kiva is? <laughs> Nobody. Well, why would you... Sandwich. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> They've changed the word linen into the word Kiva. Why? For what purpose? To make it confusing. To make it unique so they can claim it as their own creation. It's almost like their little idol. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the King James says, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, we don't corrupt the Word of God. And in the New King James it says, peddle the Word of God. And I propose to you that that's the New King James goal here through Thomas Nelson was to peddle the Word of God. They want to sell it. And if anybody knows anything about copyright laws, you have to change something. It has to be an original work. So you have to modify something a certain amount, a certain percentage, so that you can point and say this is different. And that's essentially what they did so that they can make profit out of people. John MacArthur the false prophet who loves to make profit out of people, right? make money off people, he says 
the New King James Version is an exceptionally rich and accurate translation of Holy Scripture. Because this classic translation, and what he's trying to do is he's saying, the King James, this classic translation, and then he does the bait and switch, and he wants to talk about the New King James. What he's trying to do is saying they're essentially identical. He says, this classic translation has withstood the test of time and the careful scrutiny of many. And then he says, it was a high privilege to write the accompanying study notes. So he wrote the study Bible. It was a, a high paying job, right? It was a high profit for John MacArthur to change the Bible and put in his Calvinist footnotes. And their footnotes were already there on a lot of this. So now he's going to mash it all together and try to contradict what God said. And again, this is a lie. The New King James is not the same as the King James. One of the things I also want to point is the symbol that's on this Bible. Is anybody familiar with this? A tri triquetra is what it's called. Now, quetra, quetra, yeah, I've heard different names for it. It's essentially three sixes put together. It's like a 666. This symbol historically has not been a Christian symbol. But it's the 19th century, so everything's Christian, right? That's what, that's what they act like. The, 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 this design is used as a religious symbol adopted from ancient pagan Celtic images by Christianity. As is common in Christianity. It is similar to Odin's symbol, the Valknut. Listen, this symbol is not of God. There are musical bands that openly worship the devil. They sing to the devil. They claim they're sold their soul. And they put that same symbol as artwork on the cover of their band. Yeah. There's many bands now that use this. It's like, well, are they New King James? Do they like the Bible? No, they work for the devil. The same people that made this piece of trash work for the same God, which is the God of this world, the devil himself. And they use that symbol in the occult and in witchcraft. And it's almost like they're trying to put a hex on this Bible to anybody that would be deceived by it. You're in 2 Corinthians 12. Look at verse number 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. What he's saying is, I was talking to a guy and it was in the spirit. I'm not really sure if I were really in my body or not. It's almost like an out-of-body experience, but it's, it's really like a supernatural, miraculous experience. And God knows because it was of God. There was a miracle here. He says, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now turn to Genesis 1. What the Bible's teaching here is that there are three heavens. There are three heavens. From our perspective, we look up. We see the sky that the birds are in. We see outer space or cosmos that the stars are in. And then we can't see it, but then there's God's throne, the third heaven. Where this man was saying in the Spirit, this guy was caught up to the third heaven. He was carried by the Lord to see a miraculous vision. So there are three heavens that are taught in the Bible. It's called paradise. In Luke 23, Jesus said, Verily, verily, he said, Verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. All right? Now, he was with the Godhead that same day in heaven. Revelation 2, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So paradise is used to reference the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Specifically, God's dwelling place, where God's throne is. Now, the King James Bible has it right in, in Genesis 1. I want you to see this. This is very important. This is the easiest verse to spot a fake Bible. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. From the very beginning, the devil is attacking the Word of God. Look what it says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Very clear. Now there are three heavens. This first day, God creates His dwelling place. God creates His area. This is before everything else. Every other Bible says heavens, plural. Whether it's a New King James or an NIV, they change the first verse 
They make it plural. God did not create three heavens on the first day. He tells us what order he makes these things. And to say such a thing makes the Bible a lie. It makes it contradict itself. Look, so the first day he created light and day that first day. Look at verse number 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Look at verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So here in the second day, God clearly creates heaven. Now, if He created all three heavens on the first day, wouldn't that be a contradiction? Yeah. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And every other Bible attacks Genesis 1.1. Listen, this is basic doctrine. This is the beginning of the Bible. And anybody that has a bad Bible, you can take them there and show them what has been changed. This is important. We also So the firmament, that's what God called it, the firmament. I heard a guy one time say, if you're driving down the road and you put your hand out the window, it's, it's like it's firm, but there's nothing really there. I'm like, okay, makes sense, sort of, you know. But God uses this, this word firmament to describe the heavens. Then he names it heaven. And, of course, then in the third day, he creates the dry land, the earth and grass. The fourth day, he creates the sun, moon, and stars. Now look at verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So here he's talking about on the fourth day that God is creating the sun, moon, and the stars. And that we can use calculations for times from it. God set them in, in the heavens for a reason. And this is outer space. This is cosmos. This is not where the birds fly. This is not where God dwells. On the fifth day, God creates the fish and the birds. Look at verse number 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So here we have the, the third heaven, really the first heaven from our perspective, which is where the birds fly. It's the open firmament of heaven. The birds are going to fly around in it. So those are the three heavens that God created. He did it all in the first week, but He did not do it in the first day. Otherwise, that verse just simply contradicts it, makes things very confusing. We know on the sixth day, God created the land animals and mankind. And on the seventh day, God rested. Now look at Genesis chapter 2. Verse number 1. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He hath made. I want you to think about this. In Genesis 2.1 it says He finished creating the heavens. He had to do it over a series of days. He didn't have to. God could have snapped His fingers. He did it for a reason to teach us something. But Genesis 1.1, if He created all three on the first day, that would be a contradiction. Not only the verses 14 and 20 we looked at, but Genesis 2.1, it would be a contradiction. So very important. Now turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now I told you that the, Bi that the New King James Bible removes God's name, Jehovah. In Exodus 6 it says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. They actually put, by my name, the Lord. Well, that's actually less, con that's confusing. He already said Lord in the verse. Why, why, you know, why the contradictions? If you read it in the New King James, you're just, wait a minute, what? I thought he already said he was the Lord. But they, they want to dumb down the Bible and cause you to doubt God's, God's, purpose and God's name and God's all the, all the things, all the characteristics and attributes of God. In Isaiah 12, he says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Now, when he says the Lord Jehovah in, in this Bible, it says Yah. Y-A-H. Yah. I don't know if that's like, yeah, or y'all, or yay, or I don't know what, the, you're like, but this is not the same, this is not derived from the same words, from the same English even. It's not 
Yahweh. It is not Yeshua. That comes from a perverted interpretation. Yeah. It is Jehovah. That is God's name. They change it. In Isaiah 26, he says, Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So here the same thing where he says, For in the Lord Jehovah. He said, right? That's his name, Jehovah. They put Yah. Now listen, when they when anybody tries to change God's name to Yah or Yahweh, what they're coming from is a Germanic interpretation of Hebrew. This is not what the Hebrew said. This is the way a German would say. Anybody ever heard of Yiddish? Yiddish? Yeah. Yiddish is like slang language, how the Germans that became some of the Germans that had become spiritually Israelites, right? They became Jews in religion. They were not actually Hebrew in, in origin. They didn't come from the 12 tribes. They tried speaking a dead language, and this is the result. Right. Hebrew was unspoken for several hundred years. And then all of a sudden, people are going to try to read it. Their grandfather didn't read it to them. Nobody read it to them. And they come from a Germanic background. So what do they come up with? Uh, Yah. Yahweh. Yahshua. Instead of Jesus and Joshua and Jehovah. Right. as the Bible teaches. In Luke 20, he says, Likewise also the cup after the supper, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And they change it to New Covenant instead of New Testament. God's clear about there must be a, a death of the testator. That we have a living will and testament is something that people do today and they want to pervert that. Now the biggest thing that's changed is salvation in this Bible. In Acts chapter 2, where you're at, I want you to see verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Right? So this is where they're out preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. Every day the people that would believe they got saved. But what does the New King James say? Those who were being saved. Being saved. Let me ask you, are you being saved or are you saved right now? <laughs> if you think you're being saved, then you're trying to do it yourself. Right. You're yeah. trying to work your way to heaven and frankly, God will not accept you. Right. You're right. either saved and it's done or you're unsaved. There's no in between. There's no gray area. It's not a process. Hey, growing in the Christian life, that's a process. Yeah. Growing as a better man, a better husband, a better wife, that is a process that takes time. Being a better human being, that takes time. But becoming saved in your soul, your spirit being sealed to the day of redemption, that's a one-time thing. It happens when you believe. In this same chapter, where Acts 2.31, where it says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that His soul was not left in hell, neither His flesh did see corruption. It says His soul was not left in Hades. Isn't that in the Caribbean? Where, where is Hades? Isn't that a country? I mean, think about it. Why would you call something confusing? It's clear that Jesus teaches He went to hell for us. The punishment for my sin is death and hell. Jesus paid it all, both death and hell. Now I've been forgiven. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So Genesis 1.1 is a great place to take somebody with, with the wrong Bible. Where we're going in 1 Corinthians 1, this is the second most important place I think you can take someone to show them how it changes salvation. And in fact, if you, if you only have time to take them to one place, you may want to take them to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse number 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross, to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And what does the New King James say? Us who are being saved. Being saved. It's a process. It's dead wrong. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse number 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. Again, we are saved. And yeah. guess what this one says? Being saved. Being saved. 
It, this, they do a hatchet job on this verse. I'm not even going to read it. It's so confusing. But they, they change. Everywhere it says we're, we are saved, they change it to being saved. And that's not the only thing they attack. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. Verse number 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And guess what they change it to? From are sanctified to being sanctified. They want to cause confusion. And listen, there is sanctification of the soul and the spirit once you're saved. And yes, we should sanctify our body. We should start to set our body apart and follow God. That's a choice we have every day. And in this verse, we're talking about those who are saved, they're sanctified. They want to change it. Well, they're being sanctified. That's a work salvation. Sure. That is salvation over time, yeah. which of course causes doubt. That's what a lot of the Calvinists would teach. That they're, of course, I'm, I'm perfect now, but if I don't endure, well then you're not saved. Amen. You have no assurance of salvation. Now, stay right there for a second. I'm going to read a couple verses to you. In Hebrews 10, he says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Perfected forever them that are sanctified. And of course, they change it to being sanctified. Totally changes the verse. Acts 17.22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things ye are too superstitious. You guys know what superstitious is, right? All right? They change it to being very religious. These people are unsaved. They're pagans. They're worshiping idols. And he says, oh, you're very religious. Yeah, kind of like the Catholics are very religious. They have their idols. But that's what this Bible wants to support is every other religion except biblical Christianity. In Ephesians 5, he says, therefore be followers of God. That's what we're commanded to do, right? You're a Christian. That means you're following Christ. You're trying to follow in His footsteps. You're His disciple. The New King James says, therefore, be imitators of God. Imitators? Is it like being a wannabe or something? Like, no, why don't you be a Christian? Don't be a wannabe. Be a follower of God. Obey yeah. what He says. Sure. Look, you're in Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse number 16. For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Now look at this verse as I read it from the New King James. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Is that even saying the same thing? No. Give aid means to help somebody. Here it's talking about how Jesus didn't come down in a glorified body. He came down in flesh. He was a human being. And they want to change that because Jesus Christ is under attack in this false Bible. Turn to John 11. John chapter 11. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 7, where the Bible reads, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now you men that know your prophecy, who is the he talking about here? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. And in the, the New King James Bible, they capitalize the word he twice in this wow. verse. As if to say it's God. That is crazy. They're, they're calling well, a reference to the Antichrist, they're calling it God. Wow. It's wicked. In John 1, 12 it says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. But you know what? They take the power out. They say you're given right. You're given right. Like you have some pedigree of salvation. You've been given a right. No, you're given power through your faith. Through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in John chapter 11. Look at verse number 25. Verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, the New King James says, He who believes in me, listen, though he may die, he shall live. The Bible says we were dead. You were spiritually dead. We just touched on this as we preached through Peter that, hey, we were dead. We were preached unto the dead. I was spiritually dead. And here he says, you may die. 
you may or may not go to hell. No, hey, I deserve death and hell. The second death, according to the Bible. We're all found guilty. But they want to change that. They want to make it confusing. They want to make it ambiguous. And it's, it is a wicked Bible. It is not of God. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. This will be the last place we go this morning. Romans chapter 1. They change so much in this Bible that there are many passages that you read through that are very basic, very fundamental, the first principles, and you start becoming confused when you see how they select a word that they use in a passage over and over just to push their doctrine. Uh, there's, well, I won't get off, off, off course here. Let's just go to Romans 1, verse 25. Look, it says, "...who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever." Amen. Now here in your Bible where it says, "...who changed the truth of God into a lie." To change the truth, you have to have the truth, and you pervert it, you debase it, you turn it into something totally different. You've, made, you've defiled the truth, right? You changed the truth. Yeah. In this, it says exchanged the truth. Exchanged the truth. Hey, if I go to the Bible store and I exchange this and I say, hey, uh, God's missing out of this. Can you give me a better Bible? Can you give me a King James? That would be an exchange, right? Give me something different because this ain't right. That's an exchange. Now, when it says who changed the truth, if I open up the King James Bible and I write a verse down and I change the verse to say something different and I tell you it's the Word of God, that's changing. Yeah. That's wicked. Yeah. And that's, that's what they have done. But they here they change it to exchanged. We just exchange it for something different. That's not what God teaches. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For their women, listen, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And again, they use the word exchange. It, no, they changed it. Yeah. They changed the Word of God. They're changing what God had designed for a marriage relationship. They've perverted it. They didn't exchange it for something. Right. They've, they've perverted it. In Revelation 22, it says, If any man take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written therein. These false prophets that created this Bible to make money God's saying your name cannot even be written in the book of life. There yeah. is no salvation for these people. They've gone too far. They've changed the Word of God and they're peddling it as if it, it's God's. Now look at verse 28 in this. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now again, they take the word reprobate out. They take the word sodomite out of the Bible. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Big difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big difference. It's wicked. Why did they change the Bible? Because of copyright laws. To make something new for deception because they want to put that label on there to make you think it's just as good. To make more money. In 2 Peter 2, he says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, that means fake words, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not? Hey, they have hell to pay for creating this. They have hell to pay. Their damnation slumbereth not. Even if they take that word damnation out of the verse, it doesn't change the fact they deserve hell for changing God's word. It's crazy. The New King James, remember Matthew 7.14 is a good place to take somebody. And any other false Bible... Genesis 1.1 from the very beginning and 1 Corinthians 1.18 where you can see they're changing salvation. I know this is kind of a, a deep study for, for Sunday morning and some of you may think it's a little bit dry, but I think it's very important to be armed against the wiles of the devil. I think it's very important to be educated about how to defend why and what you believe. As a church, we are King James only. The Bible is preserved. It is perfect. It is profitable for doctrine. And we need to know why and what the difference is. That's right. And when That's right. somebody that you love says, well, I got a new King James, it's just as good, isn't it? What do you say? No, just as good as trash. Yeah. It's just as good as all the other trashy, fake Catholic Bibles that change the doctrine, that change God, and it's unacceptable in this church. 
We can trust the Word of God. You can trust the King James Bible that you have in your hand. It's the same thing since God said it. If you don't think God's big enough to protect this, then you probably don't trust Him with your soul either. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the miraculous things that we read of and learn of You. Lord, I just pray that You would empower our soul winners today as we go out and preach the Gospel to the lost. Lord, I pray that You would open up doors for us and help us to increase Your kingdom for You by, by humbling ourselves and sacrificing our time. Lord, we love You and we love how simple it is to be saved. It is not difficult. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.